It's good to be here. Are you guys glad to be here? I hope so. It's going to be a, a good day. I, I really do feel like the Lord put something on my heart to really impact. So one thing, when Pastor originally uh, said something about going away for a month, my request was that, uh, that I would have two Sundays in a row. Uh, because I like to be able to build off. Uh, we do it in, in our, with our teenagers all the time. We feed off of messages and series and stuff. And I just really desired to be, be able to do that. And originally, I was going to go one direction and do uh, something completely different. But then the Lord put something else in my heart. About over a year ago, um, within our Forge ministry, we did a series called Love, Sex, Drugs, and the Rock That Doesn't Roll. And uh, it was an incredible series. We spent a whole semester on this because it's something that we need to talk about. And uh, when I started praying about this, he brought that message or that series back. And I'm thinking, man, that is, it's so relevant, not just for teenagers, but for humanity. And how all these things, we, we search for all these different places for wholeness, like love and sex and different things. And, and the reality is what we're really searching for is God. And I'll get to all of that. But so... This week and next week, it's going to be a really condensed version, and it's going to be a lot of information because uh, picking and choosing what to put in this because there's so much to it is really hard. So this is kind of a condensed version of that. But before we get into that, you go ahead and go to the first slide. Nope, not that one. Hey, that one. Oh, no, back, back. Was there one right before that? Yeah, there we go. So there's this Bible app called YouVersions, or it's called the Bible app. If you don't already have it on your phone, I'd really encourage you to download it. And I, I used to be against this a long, long time ago about having a physical Bible in our hands, and I still love having a physical Bible in my hands. But technology is not going to change. So what's incredible about this is this is a great resource with tons, like over 100 different translations. Uh, Incredible things on this this version. There's all kinds of uh, versions, but if you look up Bible and under like the third heading, it says U version. Uh, I encourage you to download that, and we're gonna play off of that a little bit this morning. In fact, you can go to the next one now. In fact, if you open that version, you can go ahead and open it if you have your phone out. Open it. You go to the bottom right hand corner to where it has three dots and it says more. Click on that. And about halfway through, you can go to events, you click on that, and then this whole message will actually show up on your app. Something I really cool, we, I've learned that we, did, we do with our teenagers, uh, but you can actually, all the scripture, all the notes are actually on that app uh, by going and doing that. And in fact, you're saying, I don't want to download it right now, you can download it later, it'll still be available up to like five or six days and when you click on that and you go to the bottom right hand corner it says save event or save something it says save i don't remember what but it'll save to your phone and you'll actually have it all for as long as you have the app that way you can go back to it look at the notes if you miss something it's on there and you can also add notes it's a really cool resource and so i actually did that for you guys this morning so you can actually check it out but I uh, encourage you to, if you don't have that app, go ahead and download it because it's, it's just a great app. You can also do plans and different things. Uh, several guys in the church I, I uh, connect with, we actually have done several plans through it. Jerome and I went through the whole Bible together through it. Uh, it helps you to stay accountable, what days, where to read, and all that kind of stuff. It's just a great app to have. So I just encourage you guys. And for today, if you want to have the notes instantly, you can actually go on there. So it's pretty cool. Um, Getting back to what we're talking about, in an average lifetime, the average American spends three years in business meetings, that's a lot, 13 years watching TV, $89,281 or spend that much on food, I feel like that should have been more, but uh, consumes, this one's about right, 109,354 pounds of food, makes 800 trips to McDonald's. If you're laughing, you probably relate to that one. Spends six thousand eight hundred eighty-one dollars in vending machines. Uh, eats thirty-five thousand one hundred and thirty-eight cookies. Yeah, I could probably understand that one. Uh, eats a hundred or one thousand four hundred eighty-three pounds of candy. Catches three hundred and four colds. Is involved in six motor vehicle accidents is hospitalized eight times for men, 12 times for women. I'm not reading too much into that. Uh, speed spends 24 years sleeping. That's crazy. 
all these numbers that kind of just like define our lifetime are pretty interesting. What I would like to know is how much time we spend on worrying or how much time we spend on things that we are fearful of or how much time that we waste on any given day, right? A lot of these things, uh, and I'm not saying we should be against TV or any of this kind of stuff, but we do waste a lot of time, social media and different things. But, and, and then I, I wonder, when I, and when I read things like this, I often ask myself, what am I doing with the time I have? How am I spending my time? How much time am I wasting chasing things that don't matter? Right? While this is a list of superficial things, there are real things in life uh, that I go to and I chase over and over and over, uh, and it's really a chase for something more. We, we chase for things over and over and over for a sense of wholeness in our life. And there's different things that we chase on a daily basis, but one thing that we have to spend a lot of time talking about, which is love. Uh, so the question or the foundation of this whole thing is the question, what fills your cup and what satisfies your soul? What fills your cup and satisfies your soul? Because we all chase something, whether we realize it or not. And honestly, I mean, as we, well, you'll see through this whole message, the obvious answer is Jesus, but that's not the reality all the time. But we all chase something. We all look for a foundation, or the foundation of this chase is always wholeness. We're looking to feel whole, to feel content. The greatest place we go for ultimate satis satisfaction is love, right? If you really think about it, our world revolves around this word. We chase for relationships, uh, we, or once we're married, we're all consumed in it and all these things, which I'm not saying are bad things, but we love love, Right? I mean, there's a reason Lifetime exists, the, 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 not the show, but the, you know, program, channel, thank you. There's a reason it exists. Of course, men are always the murderers on those shows, but that's not the point. We love love. You know I'm right. I don't care what you say. The greatest place we go is love. We love romantic movies, right? We, and don't even get me started on the Hallmark Christmas movies. All right, don't even get me started. <laughs> all the guys are like, yeah. And all the girls are like, yeah, right? We love it. We love the sappy stuff. We love these different things. And I grew up, my mom uh, always read the romantic novels, which looking back, they're very inappropriate, but just anyways. Um, mom, I don't know how many of you, don't answer that, have read some of those, right? We love love. Chick flicks are not foreign in my house. Right? They're not. In fact, my wife is so cute about them. Uh, anytime we watch them and it gets to that sappy part, I always know to look over and she's got this big grin on her face and she's all in. And I'm just like, okay. We understand this is not reality, all right? We don't live in a Hallmark movie. But we, I know, shocking. I always hear music when I talk about love, right? No. And for the last seven years, anytime we, oh, I just said that, but yeah, we love love. Our culture is driven, unfortunately, by an emotionally driven understanding of love. And it changes how we do life because we, we see love much differently than I feel like God established in the beginning because we think it's all emotion and sappy and if it doesn't feel right, then it must not be love. But we're so far from what I believe God intended out of love. And you know, we struggle when we, we're single because of this image. When we're single, we think that we have to be in a relationship to be whole, that we have to have somebody in our life to have satisfaction. And not just for single people. When we get married, we just think, wow, they're not doing something the way I expect them, so they must not love me. Or have all these crazy expectations. Or maybe if you are widowed or divorced, you're thinking, man, I just have to have somebody else that's not like the last person that will actually love me the way I want them to so that I can be whole, that I can be complete. Or you might be thinking, if you're, gonna, if you're married, if they would just pay a little more attention to me, then I would be happy. Or if they would just spend a little more time with me, then I would be satisfied. If they would just show me a little more effort and love me better, then I would have joy. While we are all created with a natural desire for a relationship, 
We were never created with the intention that something or someone would fulfill you. Let me say that one more time. While we were created with a natural desire for a relationship, we were never created with the intention that something or someone would fulfill you. My wife does not complete me. She does not complete, she compliments me, which is a much better and much more, uh, I believe, satisfying look about our relationship. She compliments me, just an example, and I don't even know why I want to bring this up, but I'm going to bring it up. But, no, this is more on me than you. For once, I'm going to embarrass myself and not you. <laughs> but just this moment, there'll be much more later in life. I actually warned her when we got married that you're going to live a life of me embarrassing you. That's just, so when you say I do, you're signing, okay. Um, but she completes me, or compliments me, not completes me, in so many different ways. And she, her strengths are my weaknesses and vice versa. She compliments me. One of the things she's very good at is she's my, or our, family information bank, right? She knows everything. I don't know anything. Uh, she knows everything about our kids. She knows, I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if she knows her blood type. I mean, she just knows everything. Some of us men, we understand that, that our, our wives are that way. They're, she's an organizer. When it comes to our household, I'm terrible at that. Ministry, I'm different, but household, it's, it's, it's out of the picture. All right, so she's very good at organizing. But anyways, last week, uh, I took... Isabella, our youngest, our seventh month old, seventh month old, yeah, uh, to the doctor, to the E, is it EMT, ERT? ENT, thank you, I never get that one right. Uh, we took her to the ENT, uh, so just be praying for her. She has to have tubes put her in ears next month, uh, so there's that. Anyways, took her to the ENT, and uh, I, I grabbed her and went to the, to the doctor's office, and she was going to meet us there on her, her break, because uh, she was working that day. And I sit in my truck, and she hasn't gotten there yet. I'm like, you know what? I'm going to get her, get Isabella, Izzy, and we're going to go ahead and go in and start filling everything out. That was mistake number one. Uh, to go in there before mom gets there to fill out paperwork. So I already, as I'm walking up to the door, I'm thinking, this is a mistake. This is a mistake. This is a mistake. What am I doing? What am I doing? Wait for her. Just wait for her. Uh, and I get to the door, and, and I'm already, uh, I've already lost at that point in my head. And I get up there, and they ask me, well, what's her birthday? <laughs> Seriously, it left me. I was so embarrassed. I'm like, I was looking at my phone. I, I could not remember. For, I was like, I was there. I promise. It was seven months ago. I could tell you how it happened. When it, not how it happened. When it happened, <laughs> right? Well, I could tell you that too, but I could tell you these things. I was there. I promise. I was so embarrassed. I was. I'm like, I'm sitting there sweating. I'm like, I promise I'm her father. I promise. Like, I, I really am. It's, it's December 12th, by the way. I, I got it now. Uh, and this guy walked in and, like, just pure relief. I'm like, I'm so glad you're here. <laughs> she compliments me. And, and going into this marriage, and I told her at the beginning, and we had this agreement that she would never be my God and I would never be her God. Right? Our God is primary. We are secondary. She compliments me. She doesn't complete me. And when we finally understand that, embrace that, then I feel like we're going to be much better off. And in fact, I know we, we think about like Genesis. I think it's Genesis 2. It says a man, a man leaves his father and his mother and hold fast to the wife, and they shall become one flesh. You're saying, well, one flesh, isn't that complete? No, oneness and completeness are very different things. And, and in talking about that, and this just dawned on me this week, and it kind of blew my mind as I was thinking about it. But going back to the original, uh, two original human beings, Adam, Adam and Eve, before the fall of man in Genesis 3, we see the picture of a perfect couple. Uh, there was no sin. Life was beautiful, and things were perfect. God created man and woman, and uh, it never said that woman was to complete the man, but it, she was his helper. In Genesis 3, it says, Now the serpent was more crafty than any wild animals of the Lord that God made. He said to the woman, Did God really say you must not eat from the garden? The woman said to the serpent, We, must, we may eat from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it, or you will die. You will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman. You, for God knows when you eat from it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. 
When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it. It dawned on me this week about this situation. And this is how I know that we were not created to complete one another. Adam and Eve had the perfect relationship, right? They had a perfect situation. God created a perfect environment and a perfect atmosphere, and yet Eve was still not satisfied. She still went for the fruit. If we were to complete one another and they were in a perfect situation, Eve never would have done that because he completed her. He, she didn't need anything else. But that's not how it was. Eve chose to eat the fruit, which means and confirms that we were never created to complete one another. Right? If you really think about it, if, if the perfect situation or relationship happened and she still did that, then it proves to me that Adam wasn't enough for her. Because, because of this, we could say that love does not or is not meant to be solely with one another. Example, this is, this is a reason why I feel like over time we have got a, such a warped view on love. So I want to try something, and if this fails, I won't do it in a second service. This is kind of beauty of it. Uh, I need four people. Can I get four people to volunteer? Justin, sure. Thank you. Come on. Uh, three more people. Just give me three people. I know where. Thank you, Dana. Two more people. All right, Beth and Jerome. Okay. Fantastic. This might not work, but we're going to make it. See what happens. <laughs> yeah. Those are on Facebook, by the way. I uh, appreciate you guys being here. These notes are also offered to you on the Bible app, just to let you know. I want you to stand in line right here. Stand in line right here, right here. I know some of you, no, just come toward me. There you go, everybody in line. Face this wall. All right, and just stay there until I call you back. All right. They're going to stay there the whole service. That's not true. All right, Justin, I want you to come up to the pulpit. Everybody else stay there. Justin, you can turn around, come to the pulpit. All right, Justin, I'm going to show you a word, and you're going to have about 10 seconds to draw a picture on this paper as big as you can uh, defining this word. You can't use letters or any of that kind of stuff. You just have to, just like charades, okay? There's your word. So 10 seconds, make it work. <laughs> That's what you're going with? Okay. You can go back over there. Leave it there. It's going to be interesting. <laughs> All right. Who's it? Nate, Dana, come on up. All right. Dana, I'm going to show you a picture, and I want you to write down a word that best describes the picture. Okay? Just one word. All right? Okay. That's not where I thought I was going to go. Go ahead. All right. Bethany? All right, I'm going to show you a word. You're going to draw a picture, okay? Oh, that's interesting. Okay. All right, Jerome, you're up. You put yourself there. I didn't tell you where to go. All right, I just want one word. Okay. All right. All right, go ahead and turn around. I just want to hold it to your chest. All right, just to show everybody the word. This is the word that he had, he had to go off of, beauty, okay? So this is the word we're going to end up. Show your picture of what you see beauty is, okay? See, I didn't see that coming, all right? All right, show your word, love. Okay. This is where I, this was interesting to me. Show your picture. That was pretty good, I thought. And then show your word. Jesus. Okay. So this is, didn't take the route that I, I originally thought was going to, but that's okay. The, the point is, just ignore the uh, religious background here, because <laughs> it's like, you ask something in Sunday school, they're always going to try to sound right and religious. There's always those people. I'm going to make sure I don't spend or get religious people in an expert service. All right. Um, uh, I need some sinners up here. No. Uh, all right. So here's our word. It's beauty. 
Okay, here's the reality of life. And this is how I know that over time, something like love has changed so much. Because in reality, as we go through life and we, we experience different things, then we define things differently without going back to the source. And over time, we started with something like beauty. And again, this is not where because I can't say Jesus is the wrong answer. But Jesus, we end on Jesus, which is not exactly the true word, but it is a version of this word. All right, guys, you guys have a seat. Just take that with you. Go ahead. That's a good memory. Appreciate you. Yeah. A bunch of religious people. Thank you. Thank you for ruining it. No. No. That's, but the truth is, is what happens over time and, and through situations, through experiences in our life, we start defining things much differently than the original intention. And that's what we've done with love over the years because of different situations, different environments, our love for Hallmark movies or different situations. Uh, we have defined love much differently than the original uh, definition or explanation of love. And so we have to, as a human body has to go back to the original definition and explanation of love so that we can experience it the way that it was intended. So, which brings us to John 4. This is a long read. Just stay with me. Uh, John, 1 John 4, verse 7. Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his, love, his, sent his one and only Son into the world that we might live through him. This is love. Not that we, have God, we love God, but that he loved us and sent his Son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. This is how we know that we live in him and he in us. He has given us of his spirit. And we have seen and testified that the Father has sent his Son to the Son to be the Savior of the world. If anyone acknowledges that Jesus is the Son of God, God li lives in them and they in God. And so we know and rely on love the love God has for us. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in them. This is how love is made complete among us so that we will have confidence on the day of judgment. In this world, we live we are like Jesus. There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. We love because we for, he first loved us. I couldn't cut that down any. I was reading that, I'm like, all of that has to go. Because this is a true definition of what love is. And if we want to have a, a great horizontal relationship in our life, then we have to fully understand the vertical relationship. Right? The first thing is God is love, and his love is not an emotion. Although his love sparks emotion, it is not emotion. God's love is action. In love, Jesus drove out evil spirits in Mark. He healed Peter's mother-in-law, healed sick and oppressed. He healed leprosy. He healed the paralytic who let down from the roof. He healed the withered hand, raised the dead, calmed the storms, cast out demons, heals the woman uh, with the issue of blood, raises Lazarus, restores Bartimaeus, uh, restores Bartimaeus, fed 5,000 plus, not to mention he was willing to be caught, tortured, and died for us. Love is action, and this is just four books out of the entire Bible. There's 62 other books full of ex examples of his love. And what if, if, what if we sh swift shift that into a, a worldly understanding of love? It would look a little more like Jesus felt passionately for the evil spirits or the people with evil spirits. Jesus sympathized with Peter's mother-in-law. Jesus was compassionate for the sick and oppressed. Jesus mourned for those who died. Jesus ignored the 5,000 because he wasn't feeling it. Right? I mean, if it was just emotionally driven, it would drastically change this God that we worship. He was, he led and loved by action. And so we can't ignore that. We can't ignore the fact that love is action. And you know what? We can't reject God and claim to understand love because God is love. If we want to have a glimpse or an understanding of love, then we first have to know God who is love. 
which blows my mind for all these people who don't know him and yet claim to love people. No, you have no idea. You don't have the capacity to love without God because he is love. Anything outside of God is not love. I know that's a strong statement, but that's the reality because God is love. So how do we understand that a little bit more? If we accept that God is love, then we can begin to embrace his love. Two great things about God's love. The first thing is everlasting. God's love is not temporary, nor does it have the ability to fade. This horizontal love right here always seems to fade and change over time without the vertical, right? Romans 8, 35, neither death nor life, neither present nor the future will be able to separate us from the love of God. Have you ever been in a relationship that you fear would end? Have you ever been in a relationship that you just ultimately feared? Do they really love me? Do they really find me attractive? Are they, are they going to leave me? That love produces fear, but God's love never produces fear. It's everlasting. It never allows us to wonder because it's true. The world's version of love always seems to produce some type of fear because it's not established in the true love of God. Second thing about God's love is it's unconditional. It's not based on condition. His love is not out of response of your actions. This rock, our world, this, this completely destroys our, our thought process because we live in a culture that is so inundated with conditional, con- conditional love, right? That person must love me because I did something right or I presented myself in a way that allows them to love me. We live in a very conditional world, but God's love is not conditional. Romans 5 and 6, you see, you're, as, I can't talk today, obviously, as just the right time when we are still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person, someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He didn't die for you because you are worthy because we're not. He died for you because he unconditionally loves you. It's not because of the things in your life that you've done well or the sin that you've avoided. Because if that were the case, then he would have never died in the first place. Right? He loves you unconditionally. So let that sink in. You are worthy of his love. You are worthy. And sometimes shame and doubt and distractions and and not loving ourselves gets in the way and it robs us of of truly embracing God's love because we just think that how can he love me when I have all this sin on me? How can he love me when I don't even love myself at times? Right? But we have to get out of that mindset because God's love is unconditional. And it's okay to, to understand that you are worthy. You should receive that. You are worthy of his love, not because of who you are, but because of who he is. And understanding this allows us to embrace his love and allows his love to fill us up. But rejecting this forces us to go elsewhere to find what we think will be the equivalent. Hence, love and other drugs. Guess what? Mankind cannot satisfy this. Man, no human relationship cannot satisfy the crave that you have for love. God requires our input, which is the embrace, and it also requires our output, which means our deliver, which means we need to embrace his love and we need to show him that we love him. Even though that he, we don't have to do anything to deserve his love, but it's a natural response for us to love him back. If you fully received and embraced his love, it would, it would almost be impossible not to love him back if we fully received it. You cannot love others effectively if you don't first love relation, you don't have a love relationship with Jesus. Um, Mark 12, one of the greatest teachers of the law came and heard uh, the debating, noticing that Jesus had given them a good answer. He asked them, of all the commandments, which is the most important? 
So he corners Jesus. He says, he's essentially saying, what is the most important teaching that the God of the universe can give? And he says, and, and the order of this is important. He says, love your God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and love the neighbor. All right, this order is so important. He says, love God first before you can love people. Before you can have a relationship, you, horizontally, you have to have a relationship vertically to fully understand this love. So how do you love God with your entire heart, soul, and mind? I'll start with heart. Re, uh, Matthew 6, 21, for where your treasure is, your heart will be also. Making him the greatest treasure will give, you, give us a desire to value our relationship with Jesus over anything and everything else in life. We have to treasure our Lord first because our overflow and everything else will, will come out of us, out of that right there, out of our treasures. It starts with our heart, with our soul. There's a quote by John Ortberg. It says, your soul is what integrates your will, which is your intentions. Your mind is what, or which is your thoughts and feelings, your values and, and conscience, and your body, your face, body, language, and actions into a single life. A soul is healthy, well-ordered. When there is harmony between these three entities and God is intent for all creation, when you are connection with, or connected with God and other people in life, you have a healthy soul. So to love God with my soul means honoring him with my will, which again, attitude and intentions, which results in emotion, thoughts, feelings, and body. Uh, Psalms 103, praise the Lord, my soul, all my inmost being, praise his holy name. Our inmost being. And then our mind. Your mind is what dictates your actions. Love him with your actions. It's easy to come here on a Sunday morning, worship him, say we love him. But if your actions aren't supporting that, then our love has no depth. Uh, Paul shares, shares with us Romans 12 about being a living sacrifice. What are you sacrificing? What are you sacrificing for your love relationship with the Lord? Sunday morning is not a sacrifice. What are you sacrificing for him? And this harmony of an authentic love relationship with Jesus will result in our cup feeling, filling up and then, as a result, overflowing, right? Our input results in overflowing. And this is when the second part of the command comes. It says, love your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. Then you'll be able to love your neighbor. Doesn't mean it comes natural. Sometimes we have to work on this. Right? But we are called to, or called to love our neighbor. Jesus made this very simple. Love God, love others. The depth of, your lo of the love that we embrace from God will determine the depth of love that we will give to others. The depth that you have in your love relationship with the Lord will determine how you love people. And then he also commands it in John 13, and he even says do it when it's hard in Matthew 5, 43, when it talks about loving your enemies. Right? It's important for us to love others, but we cannot do that effectively if we don't first embrace and love our God. It only makes sense that way. And then we go to our significant others. Our, just because we're required to love others, let me, let me tell you something, especially you single people. Just because we're required to love others doesn't mean you have to be in a relationship. Doesn't mean you have to bounce relationship to relationship to fill that void. Right, just because we're required to love people doesn't mean that's in a significant kind of uh, intimate way. It, just, it means a relationship, yes, but not necessarily what we're thinking. So love begins with God and transfers to others. He is the foundation. The love you give or receive should be an overflow of his love, and that's how we know it all. So you might ask, Joseph, how do I know if he or she really loves me? How is his or her relationship with Jesus? How does he love his God? How does she love her God? How's their relationship? Then we can begin to look at how they love you because that is a prime, primary source. If, he's, if he or she is not connected to the Father, then they're never gonna be able to love you the way they should. That's the reality because God is love. God is love. If we want to love, then we have to be connected to the source. In 1 Corinthians 13, it, it defines, it, it gives you an outline. And I remember, I, so many of us love is patient, kind, all this stuff. And we're like, all right, this is our checklist. If they do all these things and they obviously love me, right? Almost like taking a heart, he loves me, he loves me not, he loves me. 
But in reality, 1 Corinthians 13, which we use it for weddings all the time, he's not necessarily talking about marriage. In fact, like six chapters before that, Peter actually says, I'd rather you not get married. So that if, if you have to, if you're going to burn in lust, go ahead and do it. But you could do so much more if you're not. Uh, but I'm not telling you, I'm not discouraging you. I'm just saying that's what the Bible says. Uh, but anyways, at the end of this list, he says uh, that love never fails. And sometimes we think about this, and, and this leads to a question that we all think about, but we never want to ask. If love never fails, then why do marriages and relationships fail? And this is a hard question, because there, there is so many different factors in life, and I'm not, this is not a, uh, a message necessarily about marriage. This is about love, and there's so much that we could talk about. But I just want to give you three, uh, three different pillars, I guess you could say, uh, that give us an understanding of why sometimes relationships fail. The first one, love is a selfless action. Loving others is selfless, but we live in a culture that teaches and embraces selfishness. All right, it's all about me, what I deserve, what feels good to me, uh, how I feel in the moment. If I'm, if I'm not satisfied, then the marriage must, or relationship must be failing. It's all about me. Ephesians 4, 2 says it. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. I feel like that defines marriage a little bit. Sometimes we have to bear with one another in, in, in certain times, right? Because it's not always going to be happy. It's not always going to be perfect because we're human beings, right? Relation, if you're looking for a perfect relationship, then you're going to look for the rest of your life because we are, we are imperfect, Loving others is about vulnerability and realness. It insists that we hold on to God's morality with integrity. We were created in his image, image in Genesis 1, right? So we were created to love like him. So do you love your spouse, your boyfriend, your girlfriend, like Jesus loves you? If we are supposed to be in his image and love like him, then we embrace all day long, but are we loving others like he loves us? Because Jesus is pretty forgiving for us, but yet we're not very forgiving for one another, right? We hold grudges like no other. We hold on. It says keep no record of wrong, but we do it, right? An issue comes up. Well, you know what you said three years ago, all right? Right. That's usually women that say that. Just kidding. All right. Do you love your spouse or boyfriend or girlfriend like Jesus loves you? The third one, God intended love to be three-sided. Ecclesiastes 4.12, though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. A cord of three strands is not quickly broken. When we operate outside of God's vision for our lives, then our relationship becomes fragile and vulnerable. When we operate outside of what God intended for us in our relationships, and of course, then of course they're going to fail. Of course they're not going to last. Of course they're vulnerable. Because without God, we are vulnerable. There is no protection. I'm going to go ahead and close this up, Marley. You can head this way. If God is the foundation of our relationship, does that mean my relationship will be perfect now? Human beings are not perfect. We're still human. But when God is our primary source of affection, then you will, be, then you will not put all of your value on one another in, or on another imperfect human being. And as a result, your moods, your actions, your self-worth will not be dependent on your significant other. Right? Nobody should be the source of our happiness until you understand this, you will continue to search for holiness or wholeness by bouncing around your, from relationship to relationship. When you finally realize that somebody isn't going to complete you, then your expectations change a little bit, right? And you finally trust that God's going to lead you and allow you to love like we're supposed to love, then things are going to start changing. Then the things around us, then how we're, how we're affected are not always going to be dependent on the person next to us because he is enough. Is he enough for you? That's the real question of this whole series. Is he enough for you? If you're single and you're not married, you're not in a relationship, 
Would you be okay with that for the rest of your life? Is he enough? I'm not saying it will be. But you have to come to this place in your life that you realize he is enough no matter what situation I'm in. Whether you're in a marriage that you're not completely happy with, is he enough? We need to reevaluate how we love and how we receive love. And we got to get down to this question, is he enough for us? We look at Psalms uh, 23, 1 through 6. The Lord is my shepherd. We've heard this one before. I lack nothing. This speaks to contentment. Right? How many times do we look for a relationship to be content? He says, the Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures, which talks about rest. He gives us rest. Uh, he leads us beside quiet waters. He gives us peace. Is there, not, is there not peace in your relationship or in your life? Maybe you need to reevaluate. Maybe it's not the relationships that's just the problem. Or maybe it's the ultimate relationship that's the problem. Maybe you don't have one. Is he enough? Verse 3, he refreshes my soul. He recharges us. He guides me along the right path for his namesake. He gives us direction. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I fear no evil. He gives me safety. For you are with me, your rod and your staff. They comfort me. He protects us. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. He provides for us. And last, surely good, your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. He provides goodness. He provides all of this. Not anybody in this world, not any of these horizontal relationships will provide for this. He is enough. And until you figure that out, until you accept that, you're never going to be satisfied. You're never going to be whole. You're never going to be in a place where you're like, okay, this is exactly where I want to be. He is enough. There's this place. Uh, we, we started talking about Adam and Eve and how, you know, because of that relationship, we understand that he doesn't provide completeness. But after all of that happened, they were in the garden, and then shame came over them because glory left them. In fact, Pastor Richard talked a lot about that Tuesday and Wednesday. And then God enters the garden, and what do they do? They covered themselves and they hid. And then God asked, where are you? Where are you? Of course, he's God. He knows. But he still asks, where are you? And I think about that in, in, in regards to this, this conversation we're having. Because a lot of times we search so much for this and it just and produces brokenness and a heartache and it pushes us so far away from God sometimes that God's just saying, where are you? What are you doing? Revelation talks about don't forget your first love. This is what I have against you. And you're like, well, first love? Yes, because the first time you experience God for the first time is the first time you experience true love. That is your first love. Where are you? Would you stand with me? I just want to encourage you. I'm not, I'm not, we're not going to pray together. I'm going to pray for you. Uh, I just want to encourage you to think about this week. Is he enough for you? Next week, we're going to dig into several different aspects outside of love that we chase for wholeness, maybe like success, maybe intimacy. Uh, different, there's so different the places that we go that we search for wholeness, whether we realize it or not. But we're going to talk about all those other things. But this is still going to outline this whole thought process. Is he enough? All these things that we chase over and over and over, and we end up, end up in these empty places, and we wondered, how did our, we get ourselves into that? And God's saying, where are you at? We have to reevaluate. We have to redefine love for ourselves and understand that until we embrace God, then we can't even fully understand love in the first place. It's got to start with him. It starts, begins, and ends always with God. Always. Father God, I just thank you so much for your word. I thank you for reminding us what love is and reminding us that you are enough. Lord, and it's easy to say that, but Lord, give us the courage and the boldness to fully receive that this morning. 
to shift the way we think and the way we act, the way we do things. Help us embrace your love to the point that it, it changes everything around us. Lord, because anytime you show up, things change. And I just pray for change in our hearts, Lord, so that we can begin to fully love others, our neighbors, our significant others, uh, effectively because you first loved us. And I just thank you so much for your love. I thank you for all the people in this house. And I just pray that you would just uh, help them see the true love that you have for them. Lord, you are such a good father. And what you've done for us is crazy. It's amazing. Lord, you are worthy. And we just thank you so much, so much for your love. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right, y'all give it up for the Lord. Come on. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Appreciate you guys being here. You can guys have a seat. I don't even know why I make you stand. I'm sorry. I guess I want to make y'all feel like Baptist or Catholic. I don't even stand up, stand down, stand up. I appreciate you guys, you guys being here. Uh, we're going to go ahead and uh, our servant leaders can come forward. Um, I encourage you, again, I know pastor's not here, but your giving is not dependent on people. It's dependent on God and honoring him. So if you, if you uh, need an envelope, it's on the back of your chair, uh, and go ahead and fill that out for us. Uh, we, we appreciate you guys being here and continue to come this month. It's amazing. I always love hearing different people come in. I really enjoyed Richard Amador this week, Tuesday and Wednesday. He had a great word for us. Um, and then I look forward to what, what David has for us as well. I think it's, gonna, it's just great for us to hear the word, period. So uh, we're just excited. I'm excited to be back next week. Uh, we do have Forge starting this Wednesday on a normal basis. Just a heads up for our teenagers. Uh, there are other announcements. Do you want to do them, David? I don't know. There you go. Uh, <laughs> as we give today, we believe in God for Jobs and better jobs, more money, less hours, benefits, sales and commission, checks in the mail, gifts and surprises, finding money, bills paid off, settlements, inheritance, rebates and returns, debts demolished, world to see favor, success to the kingdom. Amen. Give it up for Joseph this morning.